Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. <laughs> Call the meeting to order. <laughs> Mr. Turner. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Will you bow your heads, will you please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity to live in a nation where the people have the ultimate authority and who they select to lead them. I, I hope that we will in this, on this important day, take our renewed oaths and new oaths as seriously as they are meant, and that we will keep in mind that what we are doing is making decisions that benefit the entire community. Mm -hmm. Please give us wisdom as we make these decisions. Amen. Amen. Please join with me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. At this point, we have the honor of swearing in two commissioners. They have been commissioners, they continue to be, thank goodness. And you folks elected them, and they will be sworn in again for another four-year term right now, Ms. Edwards. Jane, would you like to step down? <coughs> Meredith Edwards is the clerk of court, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Paisley. Uh, it would be great if I could look at all of you, if you will all stand for me. So we're going to do these together, um, and so if you'll follow along with me, and if you'll place your uh, left toe on the Bible, raise your right. Okay. Do you, Stephen J. Carter, and do you... William Craig Turner, Jr., solemnly swear that you will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States and the Constitution and laws of North Carolina not inconsistent therewith, and will you faithfully discharge the duties of your office as commissioner for the County of Alamance, so help you God? If so, say I do. I do. Do you, Stephen J. Carter, and do you, William Craig Turner, Jr., swear that you will well and truly execute the duties of the Office of Commissioner for the County of Alamance according to the best of your skill and ability, according to law, so help you God? If so, say, I do. I do. Congratulations. Judges, Judge Larry Brown. Good morning to Chair Paisley, to the distinguished commissioners. Good morning to everyone. At this time, it brings me great pleasure to introduce and to swear in our newest soil and water conservation district supervisor, Ms. Donna Van Hook. Family, if y'all want to come up as well, this is a special moment. If you would, please place your left hand on the Bible, raise your right. I, state your name. I, Donna Van Hook. 
do solemnly affirm that I will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States and the Constitution and laws of North Carolina not inconsistent therewith and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of my office as Alamance County Soil and Water Conservation District Supervisor. So help me God. If that is true, please say I do. I do. I state your name. I, Donna Van Hook. Do solemnly and sincerely swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States, that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the state of North Carolina and to the constitutional powers and authorities which are or may be established for the government thereof, and that I will endeavor to support, maintain, and defend the Constitution of said state, not inconsistent with the Constitution of the United States, to the best of my knowledge and ability. So help me God. If this is true, say I do. I do. And I state your name. I, Donna Van Hook. Do affirm that I will well and truly execute the duties of the office of Alamance County Soil and Water Conservation District Supervisor according to the best of my, my skill and ability, according to law. So help me God. If this is true, say I do. I do. Congratulations, Thank Mrs. Van Hook. presiding over the process of election of a chairman for you this morning and then once the new chairman is elected I'll turn it over to the chairman to conduct the election of the vice chairman so the floor is open for nominations uh, for a commissioner to serve as chairman of the board for the next 12 months I nominate John Pageley second there's been a motion and a second are there any other nominations for chairman Hearing none, the floor is closed for nominations. We are ready to take a vote. Um, all those in favor of um, John Paisley serving as chairman of the board signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh -huh. Any nays? There you are, chairman. It's a unanimous uh, decision. Congratulations. Thank you. And I thank the four of you guys. Thank you. Okay, we now need to elect a vice chair, and I would nominate Steve Carter. Second. Any other nominations? There being none, I move that we close the nominations. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's again unanimous. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Congratulations to you. Congratulations to you. <laughs> uh, my wife said, congratulations or condolences when I was elected. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you all. We next have uh, approval of the agenda. Who would you like to do the public comments first, Jim? Oh, I'm sorry. There are none. I'm, I'm informed. Speakers. Correct. There are no uh, public comments. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, okay. Motion to approve. Oh. Uh, the consent agenda. I think you have a motion. Do you not, Mr. Trump? I do, but as to consent, not as to the agenda itself. But as to different motions. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Agenda. You're correct. Okay. <clears throat> Second on the approval of the agenda. Thank you. Any comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? It's unanimous. Now, as to the consent agenda. Now, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move that with respect to the consent agenda that we remove item A and item D2 from consent. Item A, appointments and reappointments to committee assignments. The board's policy has been that that is a, 
a chair decision, not a vote of the board. So I think follows policy that we don't need to vote on it. And two, the uh, approval of the assessment and grant request. Uh, I don't have any problem with the with the request itself, but I mean we are the lead agency on a number of other agencies seeking this request. And I think that it would, it would be wise to review some of the language and some of the specifics among us and staff before uh, submitting it. So I just give us time to look at that language. I'll start to put one. Any discussion? All in favor, I signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. With that uh, change, Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Again, unanimous. Are we allowed to move this quickly? <laughs> Thomas was well <laughs> <laughs> All Okay. Miss Atkins. Good morning, board. About turning this, it feels so awkward Certainly. going sideways. There we go. Uh, and raise up the, and raise up the mic. And raise it up. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> That's the most disconcerting thing about speaking on a microphone when you can hear yourself. You know, you have some casual conversation and you have your own voice. Um, thank you for meeting with me this morning. I'm actually here kind of to facilitate. Uh, Mr. Brad Mosier is uh, with me uh, to present a request to accept a late application for exemption. Uh, this is a situation where all qualifications are present. The only issue is the date of the application that was made. And the board has the authority to extend that out and allow that to be counted as timely. That's the request that Mr. Mosier has, and I was going to hand it over to him to speak to you. Thank you, Jeremy. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Good morning, Brad. Thanks for everyone's time. Um, I need to say before I start, this is a, um, a fairly complicated point to, to make in the end, um, and a, a long road that's been traveled. So I will. I've made some comments or noted some comments I'd like to share to explain the reason for the request and, and what landed us um, here today. Um, Generally, what it relates to is a taxpayer that um, all practical appearance would be eligible for a tax exemption from property tax. Um, but the, the navigation of the qualification and ultimate granting of that, um, it, it, there's a lot of moving parts. And just to um, provide some background, I've been in the CPA business for 38 years. I have never been involved in a tax exemption application. I am familiar with that <coughs> client that um, had the exemption, and the knowledge from, from that experience was that there's an application process with the state. It's approved. You provide that to the county. Uh, the property tax listing is adjusted, and taxes result accordingly. Um, I now know, and I didn't know before, that there's also a requirement to submit to the county a specific form. Um, and that form is what was recently presented in November um, that's, that's mentioned on the um, the packet uh, for, for this topic. <clears throat> I would like to walk through um, what, what has occurred and in justification, hopefully, uh, for good cause for this taxpayer. So I provided a written uh, explanation of kind of the road travel, which I presume the, the board has had a chance to review, but wanted to add some additional comments <clears throat> uh, to supplement that request. And first and foremost, for disclosure, I'm not an attorney. I'm just a CPA. And was requested by the taxpayer, the name is Donegal, Donegal Highway Equipment Construction, uh, or Corp, out of Pennsylvania. Uh, so it's a company that's owned out of, outside of North Carolina. Um, but first I want to make sure it's clear what this is not. 
this is not a request in reality to accept a late exemption application that was only first submitted November 7th for the calendar year 2022. The taxpayer asserts all information required on the official form was effectively provided on the taxpayer's 2022 listing that was filed April 15th, 22. And it included all the pertinent information that is on the official form AB10, which I've learned to know dearly in recent weeks. <laughs> Would like to make reference to a case, um, 1994 case of Valley Proteins, the Property Tax Commission and the North Carolina Court of Appeals previously found that the taxpayer substantially complied with the law when it applied for exemption of its property from taxation as it completed its 94 listing and set forth that exempt property was construction in process and an application had been filed with the, the acronym DEAN or DEHNR, Department of Environmental Health and Natural Resources, I think is what it was called at the time. Um, <clears throat> so it had indicated just by flag on its property listing this, this property is eligible for exemption. We'll learn later if it in fact gets approved for exemption and proceed. Though the taxpayer at hand here, Donegal, was not previously, uh, it did not previously submit a form AB10, it believes it substantially complied with the requirements when it filed its listing April 15th that that exemption for certification was pending. Ironically, we, we did that without knowing we needed to. Uh, we, we indicated on the listing form filed in April that the property was subject to an exemption not recognizing or understanding that this official form AB10 should have been filed and in fact should have been filed back in January, which was before we even knew the property at hand might be eligible for the exemption. So this request of the commissioners is to consider substance over form, not the form that followed, but the substance of what, what has occurred, along with the good faith efforts of the taxpayer to complete filing and accept the late AB10 for good cause being that the taxpayer did in fact furnish all pertinent information that is required by Form AB10 as it listed its property for 2022 on April 15th of 2022. April 15th, the reason for emphasis of that date is the last date of an extended listing period for most taxpayers if they request an extension by January 31st. It's a rubber stamp process. You get an extra number of days to April 15th. And it would appear to me that that also coincides with the natural cycle of listings that need to be completed so the county can administer um, determining what the values are and what taxes and issue the bills. <coughs> Excuse me. It does not appear that the timing of the effective exemption, when I refer to effective, I'm referring to the listing that disclosed we had exemption pending, um, caused the county any incremental administrative burdens. It should be noted that the extension request for listing period is essentially a rubber stamp process that requires no payment or calls, but instead is a mere rubber stamp process to extend a listing period. The one catch is if you don't extend and file late, there's a 10% penalty. That's known and understood. Um, and that's the intended penalty, 10% of your tax um, if that occurs. The taxpayer in this case requested that his extension uh, be allowed for purposes of the form AB10 period. As an out-of-state taxpayer not previously aware of any listing requirements, Donegal had not yet concluded at January 31st that a listing was even required, and as a result did not submit its name and request the automatic extension of the listing period. <coughs> Excuse me. As the January 31st date passed, the taxpayer also did not know that its property that needed to be listed, ultimately, would also ultimately prove eligible for exemption. Again, we've got a lot of moving parts going on here. We, do we need to list? Where do we need to list? Um, and ultimately, this property might be subject for or eligible for exemption. Um, but the tax exemption on all property ultimately listed was, in fact, determined by the state to be exempt. Um, and the exemption relates to recycling property. It turns out this equipment, this subject of the listing, 100% of it, it's the same as just a multiple um, number of items used solely for recycling. Therefore, it meets the qualifications the state is determined to be exempt from property tax. <coughs> the information provided on the taxpayer's 2022 listing filed April 20, April 15th of 22, accomplished the purpose for submitting an exemption application to the county in reasonable time for the county to be on notice 
and within the generally allowed extended filing period, but for the fact that this taxpayer unfortunately did not file for an extension request. Further, it would appear that the taxpayer substantially met the standards required for its requested exemption. And it would also appear this information was provided in advance of the assessor's valuation and invoicing period to provide notice that adjustments may ultimately be appropriate if the state approved the application for tax certification after April 15th. <clears throat> the taxpayer requests the mercy of the board to recognize the automatic listing period extension for this taxpayer as a first time filer, being an out of state, not familiar with the rules, guidelines. Um, in this instance, and considering that all property that was ultimately determined to require listing in Alamance County and was also ultimately determined eligible for tax certification, for a first time filer otherwise complying with its listing and exemption application requirements, but for obtaining an extension request. If the board does not accept the form AB10 for good cause, such refusal would effectively result in a one-time penalty equal to the resulting tax plus 10% or a multiple of 11 of the normal penalty for simply filing a listing late. Indirect conflict of the purpose of the statute to allow the intended incentives for investment in property used solely for recycling activities. <clears throat> Referring again to the Valley Protein case, uh, the Tax Commission and Appeals Court of North Carolina finding in favor of the taxpayer generally suggest substantial compliance with the requirements for application should be considered favorably. To deny this request would appear to go against the primary purpose and spirit of the legislature with regard to exemption for business personal property used solely for recycling activities. As mentioned in this case, the Supreme Court has held if the strict literal interpretation of a statute contravenes the manifest purpose of the legislature, the reason and purpose of the law should control and the strict letter of thereof should be disregarded. <clears throat> the taxpayer again requests the board accept this official form AB 10 submitted for good cause due to substantial completion of the requirements that Donegal believes was accomplished with the primary purpose of the application for exemption by April 15th of 22, in which for all practical purposes filed within the general extended listed, listing period so as not to provide administrative burden on the assessor's office in processing the listing. Additionally, the effective filing of the informal application for exemption on April 15th, uh, this provided the tax assessor notice of the pending tax exemption application early in the second quarter of 22, not later in 22 as might appear from the official form AB 10 submitted on November 7th. So the point there is, you know, the official form was just recently provided once it was discovered that was a requirement and missing, but in fact, um, not by intention, but by chance, the information had been disclosed back in April, on April the 15th. So please consider, <clears throat> excuse me, though Donical unfortunately did not request its own separate extension since it had not concluded by January 31st that a listing was required. Delta, which is a related company, they have common ownership. There is a taxpayer here in Alamance County, Delta, um, Delta Highway, excuse the name, Delta Contracting. <clears throat> <clears throat> that is a taxpayer that's been here for a long time. They're related through common ownership. It filed its listing. It filed an extension. For Donegal as a first time filer, and specifically for the purpose of AB 10 filing, Donegal requests the board recognize an effective application for exemption um, on April 15th with the filing of its property listing, which included notice of the exemption application and substantially all information that's required on the official form was included on that listing. Though Delta and Donegal are practically one and the same due to common ownership, they are separate legal entities. Donegal requests the board give consideration to Delta's compliance history and extension period as if practically one taxpayer, though technically two. Uh, the, the taxpayer here has been filing listings for 25 years, paying a substantial amount of tax each year. Um, I think that's <coughs> worth noting. <coughs> Donegal's listing filed on April 15th of 22 substantially complied with the requirements for exemption in lieu of the official form AB 10 as supported in prior tax commission and appeals court case of Alley Proteins. My understanding of that case is basically it wasn't on the official form, but you provided all the information required, so that, that should at least be considered. So on behalf of the taxpayer, the request of the board is to accept the form AB 10 that was filed officially November 7th 
as a supplement to and replacement of the informal application effectively filed back in April on the 15th and 22. Um, and Donald's listing included notice that there was a pending application with the state for all listed assets. The taxpayer understands that the board um, has the authority to accept a late application for exemption upon showing of good cause. The taxpayer requests the board consider its good faith efforts to list and more importantly consider the overriding legislative intent of incentives for equipment used solely for recycling activities to protect and reserve the natural resources for the better good of all residents. As previously provided in the written request for Donegal, Donegal is, as I mentioned, a related taxpayer through common ownership to Delta, Delta being the local company. Delta has been an Alamance County resident business taxpayer located in Hall River since April of 1997, 25 plus years. And it has listed and paid taxes on substantial non-exempt property during this time period. Delta is a local employer and a taxpayer in good standing regarding its federal, state, and local filing responsibilities. Historically, all accounting and tax compliance has been performed by personnel and tax advisors in Pennsylvania, not by anyone local. <clears throat> a Pennsylvania resident owner for both taxpayers first recognized the potential requirement to disclose property owned by others upon Delta's 22 listing form after, excuse me, upon review of Delta's 22 listing form as the January listing date approached. So the time was running out, we get near January 31st, um, and, and they detect for the first time that there's this requirement to disclose property that you have in your possession is the term used uh, but owned by others and, th and in this case the other being Donegal which is in Pennsylvania. Uh, PA resident owner, Pennsylvania resident owner for both taxpayers recognize this um, form <clears throat> the point of view of the listing form and obtain an extension of the listing period. So Delta the local taxpayer did submit uh, an extension request. Um, at that point, following the extension, GBM was engaged, GBM being our firm, Gill and Bell Moser, was engaged to prepare the listing for Delta and help figure out ultimately uh, what was needed to be done for Donegal um, and prepare any listings that needed to occur. After it was concluded, the asset subject to a uh, lease or rent agreement with Delta required Donegal, the Pennsylvania company, to submit a listing to Alamance County. So now Delta needs to file a listing. We ultimately conclude Delta, uh, Donegal, which is the Pennsylvania company, needs to file a listing, only for its property that it's leasing to the Delta company. It's my understanding from Donegal owner that Pennsylvania does not have a business personal property listing requirement as exists in North Carolina. I've not confirmed that, I've not been able to, but I'm, I'm just going on what I'm, what I'm told. Therefore, the concept of a property listing for a Pennsylvania taxpayer was not familiar with the owner and since no physical presence in North Carolina by Donegal, the need for a listing had not been previously considered or recognized. For the rentals of asphalt milling machines, which is the nature um, the, of the machines we're talking about on this specific listing, machines that grind up asphalt and concrete for reuse and, and paving and building our highways, <clears throat> the rental of these machines from Donegal, the Pennsylvania company, to Delta, the Alamance County company, uh, was in effect as of January 1st listing date. Uh, the taxpayer was not initially aware that listings were required since the taxpayer considered the machines as assets of Pennsylvania since owned by a Pennsylvania company. An inquiry was, was made in late January regarding the potential listing disclosure required by the Alamance County Company uh, for property owned by others, but no conclusions were reached for actual listing requirements at that time since the assets were owned by a Pennsylvania taxpayer and also the nature of the assets were transient. They weren't like equipment anchored to the floor of the Alamance County business. These were on the move um, and they weren't in Alamance County, they were all over the place. From job to job, as you can imagine, uh, they're, they're grinding asphalt all over the state. So the nature of the assets um, not being physically present in a static location uh, did create some confusion as to you know what, what actually should be listed where. Um, the assets did not and do not sit in any one place for very long, but continuously travel from job to job. Considering the transient and traveling nature of the leased equipment and the potential physical location of equipment in multiple counties, it was not initially certain if the rental disclosure by Delta would result in listing obligations at all 
or solely in Alamance County or other counties including Alamance County or other counties excluding Alamance County. But ultimately it was concluded that practically all of Donegal's personal property leased to Delta should be listed in Alamance County. So Donegal's 2022 listing was completed and filed on April 15th of 2022, attempting to respect what would have been the extended period, but for the fact that Donegal did not request an extension. In the meantime, it was discovered that this same equipment might be eligible for exemption, but there's no list you can look at that says this particular equipment is exempt or not. So the only way to know was to submit an application to the state and let the state decide, does it meet the eligibility or not? That was done in late April into May, and the result was it was determined to be eligible for exemption. <clears throat> so along this time, a little side note I'll up straight from my notes, um, not being aware that this AB10 form was officially required, um, my personal path was I called the state, I asked the state what we needed to do, we need to submit the application, there was discussion with the state, but they wouldn't tell us if it was exempt or not. You had to file the application, they had to review, they had to visit the property, they did that and determined it was exempt. So as we filed that listing, you know, just a, uh, I guess, common sense approach is, well, wait a minute, if, if we're sending the listing in on April 15th and we don't know yet if it's going to be exempt, what happens? So I contacted the county, I talked to Mr. Akins, and was told, well, you don't need to send us a copy of the state application. Once you get the exemption, just provide that to us and we'll be able to process the, the adjustment and all should be good. What I didn't know still at this point in April was that there's an AB10 that's um, behind us that should have been filed in January. Um, Mr. Akins indicated that he assumed probably that it was already filed, which is reasonable, um, but it hadn't been filed. Um, so we, we completed the listing and to, to provide notice to the county, put on the face of the listing, all this property has been is subject to an application for exemption. As guidance on how and where to list the assets was pursued and information for the assets subject to the rental agreement that required a listing was obtained, as I've, I've alluded to, it was recognized and confirmed that the milling machines were used solely for recycling of asphalt and concrete and might be eligible for exemption under the North Carolina Department of Revenue Tax Certification Program, which is administered by the Division of Waste Management Solid Waste Section. This was pursued and certification was ultimately obtained. Throughout the process, GBM was in communication with Mr. Atkins at the assessor's office attempting to ensure that all requirements were met and to understand how any ultimate tax certification, if ultimately awarded, would be administered. As outlined in the written request to the commissioners, <coughs> As of April 15th, the taxpayer, myself, I think Mr. Atkins, I'll let him uh, speak to that, believed all was in order, um, subject only to whether or not the state ultimately provided the exemption um, to conclude the assets would be eligible or not, which in fact did happen. <coughs> so I think it's worth mentioning a couple additional prior statements of the Supreme Court uh, <coughs> referenced in this tax commission hearing for Valley Proteins. Uh, mentioned previously that includes if the strict literal interpretation of a statute contravenes the manifest purpose of the legislature the reason and purpose of the law should control and the strict letter thereof should be disregarded there is not absolute formal test for determining whether a statutory provision is to be considered mandatory or directory the meaning and intention of the legislature must govern and these are to be ascertained not only from the phraseology of the provision, but also considering its nature, design, and the consequences which would follow from construing it one way or other. And whether a particular provision in a statute is disregarded as mandatory or directory depends more on the purpose of the statute than upon the particular language used. As expressed by the Apostle Paul in the second epistle to the Corinthians, the letter killeth, <laughs> but the spirit maketh live. <laughs> I didn't come up with that. That was in the case. <laughs> Thought it was worth mentioning. <laughs> Considering all the above, to deny acceptance of Donegal's late form AB10, which technically we, we don't deny, was submitted in November, but practically the information on that form was submitted in April. However, April 
was outside of the technical listing period, which ended on January 31st. <clears throat> because Donegal didn't understand it even needed to list, it didn't submit for an extension because it wasn't sure where to file. Uh, therefore, we have this dilemma. Uh, we've got an equivalent of an application filed in April. Um, it's late. Um, so considering all of this, to deny Donegal's late AB10 at this point would effectively result in a total penalty, not just a tax, but a penalty equal to the resulting tax plus 10% late listing penalty which the taxpayer understands and acknowledges it didn't get an extension for the listing, so it, it will have a 10% penalty if it owes tax. But with regard to this exemption, the penalty is not now just the 10%, it's the tax plus 10%. Whether a tax of $10 plus a penalty of a dollar or a tax of $1,000 plus a penalty of $100, the total penalty imposed by rejecting this late application based solely on the minor infraction of not obtaining what otherwise would be a rubber, tamp, rubber stamp extension. You submit your name, boom, it's stamped, and you, you get the extension. Um, if you don't do that prior to the listing, to extend the <coughs> listing period to April 15th for the property listing itself, um, to impose such a penalty in this case would seem to be extremely excessive and punitive for, either, for the failure to request the extension for, app, for exemption application the taxpayer had not yet discovered might be filed. <clears throat> so as of January 31st, it, it wasn't even in the... You want some water? Um, that was unused. I know. Oh, wow, I would appreciate that. <laughs> that was, uh, thank you. So the, uh, <clears throat> I think my final comment there was in this case, the taxpayer couldn't know after January 31st or after the, the kind of the, the ball had dropped um, that it should have filed an extension because it didn't even know it had property to file the extension for that was eligible for the exemption. Uh, so it's kind of caught in a, in a dilemma. Some commentary uh, more so than related specifically to foster a pro-business and business-friendly environment and in the spirit of serving all taxpayers, whether a for-profit business, a not-for-profit, or an individual, it would seem the Board of Commissioners should not seek technical reasons to deny any legislatively intended incentives otherwise available to for-profit businesses. Instead, the Commissioner should seek to help and support businesses eligible for any legitimate incentives legislated and intended for North Carolina state and local business taxpayers. In the case of tax exemptions made available by the legislature, while process and timelines are warranted in general, considering the constantly increasing and excessive compliance reporting of all types and decreasing pool of technical personnel resources, the commissioners should tilt towards leniency to all taxpayers for acceptance of any and all exemption applications that might occur any time after the close of the normal listing period, but before the end of the tax year. In circumstances that could be similar to this matter, to conclude otherwise could potentially deprive any taxpayer of intended incentives when first discovered eligible any time after a January 31st of any year. Such rejections would not support a business-friendly environment. The commissioners, my opinion, should consider and liberally allow good calls for any applications for exemptions submitted within the original or general extension period and even after the general extended period with a tilt towards allowance for any application submitted within a calendar year. If approval of Donegal's Form AB 10 is not approved, the denial will effectively result in a one-time penalty that would otherwise not be due and is generally not intended to be due by the legislature, but for a majority of the board's unwillingness to allow good cause for a well-intentioned taxpayer making reasonably good faith efforts to comply with the reporting requirements while also pursuing any legitimate incentives made available by the legislature. In summary, this is a request of the board to consider substance over form along with the taxpayer's good faith efforts as a first time filer and side with what is fair and just and in support of the purpose of the statutes for incentives intended. Donegal did file its initial listing on April 15th without a prior extension request along with Delta's Alamance County taxpayers timely filed listing 
that was within the extended listing period. And the listing of Donegal included substantially all required information to sufficiently provide the county notice that 100% of its listed property had an application for exemption filed with the state pending approval. This is also a request of the board to consider that Donegal is practically an extension of Delta, a good standing resident taxpayer, and whose owners made good faith efforts to determine and meet all tax compliance <coughs> requirements, and in this matter, sought guidance and resolution as soon as practical, once possible, additional filing responsibilities were recognized. These efforts ultimately included the discovery that the business personal property of Donegal, leased to Delta, one, required a listing due to a change in business practices between the companies for the rental of equipment. <clears throat> two, was determined to be eligible for exemption from property tax if certified by the state, which certification was issued in May and promptly provided to the assessor. And three, was effectively included on an informal application for exemption to the assessor's office in substantial compliance with the information required on April 15, 2022, which date happens to be the general extended listing period if, if applied for, which in this case, Donald had not applied. Please consider, hypothetically, if a taxpayer already filed a property listing without extension by January 31st, and unknowingly at that time owned property that was eligible for exemption and then discovered it, owned eligible property after January 31st and before April 15th, to deny a late for maybe 10 in this case would unfairly deny a taxpayer that was otherwise intended to be eligible. I like to say a lot of times, you can't know what you don't know until you know it. <laughs> a taxpayer without a listing extension that was not yet aware of the potential eligibility for exemption as the January 31st date passed, the taxpayer could not know to submit an application at a previous point in time. Donegal effectively informed the county through continuous communications as early as reasonably possible and ultimately with the filing of this listing on April 15th that the exemption application was pending for all assets. In the spirit of the legislature's le legislative intent to provide incentives to for-profit businesses to invest in recycling equipment to protect and salvage natural resources and the taxpayer's diligent and good faith efforts to seek guidance from local and state authorities as soon as practical upon recognition of its listing requirement as well as the application requirements for exemption with the state and county. As was understood at the time, it seems only fair and just that the board accept the official form AB 10 submitted promptly upon request to supplement the nearly exact same data provided on its listing <coughs> April 15, 2022 with notice of the pending application for exemption. Once again, to deny the AB 10 recently submitted soon after learning of its submission and within the 22 calendar year, with my understanding that's important, um, that it is done within the calendar year even if late, and which effectively submits the same data provided in April in substantial compliance with the requirements would result in a financial penalty substantially disproportionate to the general consequences of simply submitting a late listing whether after January 31st or after April 15th if the rubber stamp extension is obtained. Donegal did file its initial listing in 2022. Prior to that, it didn't know it had any listing responsibility. We concluded, uh, with, except one, one, one prior year, did not have any uh, previous requirements. Please consider that other taxing authorities generally allow a grace or amnesty from excessive penalties for first-time filers in many circumstances. Both the IRS and Department of Revenue, there are situations where a first-time filer trying to become compliant um, can, can seek a waiver. It seems fair and reasonable that the taxpayer's good faith efforts to meet its compliance requirements as soon as practical upon discovery and confirmation of the required reporting should justify good calls for accepting the Form AB 10 as timely filed. In addition to other considerations above, the taxpayer also requests additional consideration be given for its first time filing. The taxpayer requests the board consider substance over form again and approve the AB 10 after the close of its January 31st listing period. Donegal was not able to conclude with certainty what its listing requirements were as of January 31st and further was not aware at that time that it would be filing an application for exemption for all property that was ultimately listed. Consider the open and continuous communications between the taxpayers' advisors, state and local authorities, and good faith effort to determine the proper listing requirements, and ultimately the procedures for pursuing a potential exemption. To reject the AB 10 application as filed late solely based on the date submitted, 
does not seem fair and just considering the reasonable efforts to communicate and provide substantially all required information to the assessor of April 15th. 22. The county was clearly on notice of the exemption application April 15th of 22, which for all practical purposes achieved the primary purpose of providing the county notice that the value of the listed property may ultimately need to be adjusted if tax certification was ultimately received, which it was. Now, I understand the good calls. Uh, there's a, a, a general um, consensus. Basically, you've got to die or be sick. Um, I don't think that should apply here necessarily solely. Um, it occurred to me late, um, not as I prepared all this, but a sequence of events, as I understand it, and I'll ask Mr. Akins to clarify and correct me if I state anything that's incorrect. Um, this taxpayer, it did miss a listing the year before. Uh, the, the disclosure, the, the lease has started in November of 2020, so it also has a, an obligation for 2021. And the process for um, rectifying that now provides the taxpayer an opportunity to present the tax certification so it's not taxable or my understanding is it won't be taxable for 21 if this request is not honored it will be subject to tax for 22 unless it chooses to appeal uh, beyond this board and then for 23 and forward it's exempt from tax on these specific assets so I pose a question um, that in hindsight, knowing now what I didn't know then and what I've recently <laughs> learned, there's a path where this taxpayer could have been provided an incentive to do the wrong thing to get the right result. The wrong thing being had it not filed a listing, just simply stuck its head in the sand and left this alone and waited for the county to find them, which they would when Delta acknowledged that there was a lease they would then be allowed to um, submit this application in a timely manner. I don't think that's the intention of the statute. And Mr. Atkins is shaking his head. <laughs> so, this is correct. So my overriding good cause is not what the taxpayer should have done, but what the board should do. To deny this request would suggest that the taxpayer should have done the wrong thing and not submitted a listing in order to more conveniently achieve the intended exemption result. So with that, I would like to call on Mr. Akins to clarify, if he would, the, the point I just made that um, to, to deny this request would suggest that in this specific fact pattern that this taxpayer should have just ignored the listing responsibility and waited another year and everything would have resolved itself. And I guess Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brad. And I guess that that's an interesting point. Now, if one were devious and had a very good knowledge of property tax, uh, what he says is exactly true. If they had simply not listed and we had caught them because the other entity did list that they were leasing this equipment, that would constitute a discovery. And upon discovery, they could file for their exemption timely and they would have been fine. And if we didn't catch them, they could just next year, 2023, file timely. And when we say, well, wait a minute, what about the previous years? That would constitute a discovery, which would make the application timely. So in fact, had they decided to do nothing and we caught them, we wouldn't even be here. They would be exempt and we would have moved on. Because they did the right thing by saying, hey, we need to get a, a listing out there. We need to you know, be forthright. Now we count them as late. And, and that is technically the way that the law is written, mm -hmm. uh, which means I don't have any authority to, to do otherwise. But this board does have the authority, if you so choose, uh, to take the situation into account. And Delta's current on all of its taxes, right? It's no taxes. A couple questions, Mr. Mr. Chairman, of, uh, of Jimmy. Uh, so, so, Mr. Mosley, would you approach as well? Sure. We can just ask questions to both of you together. Sure. The, the decision about whether this property is exempt from county tax is a state decision. 
Yes. And the state has made the decision that this property is exempt. Yes, exactly. Based on its use. Mm -hmm. Mr. Moser mentioned that it would continue to be tax exempt. But really, that's only if the use continues in the same way that it's being used. Correct. Used. So if you start to do do asphalt that's not using recycling, you would lose an exemption status, again, determined by the state. <coughs> the uh, It's the type of equipment. You say it's the use. It's, it's the type of equipment. Okay. But presumably, what we else would you use it for is um, it's designed for the recycling and pollution abatement. Okay. So once they've got that certification, it lasts for the life of that equipment. Uh, as they purchase replacement equipment, if they continue in this venture, they're going to have to buy new equipment anyway. The new equipment would have to go through the state to get approved. But once it's approved, that piece of equipment is its is nature done. is tax exempt. That's so it. what we need to determine is whether the the late filing, whether we'll allow the late filing. Exactly. And as I see it, there are two issues with the filing. One is that Donegal, the Pennsylvania company, did not file extension by January. It's, its sister company did, but I, you know, you, you can arrange your transactions how you like, but I think a taxpayer is a taxpayer, so I don't think Donegal benefits from its sister's filing. Um, so it leaves us with the, the issue that they haven't filed the request on the proper form. Mm -hmm. the, the county had notice in April of substantially what they were asking for, but it wasn't on the proper form. Mm -hmm. And then the statute says that we can approve this request based on good cause, mm -hmm. right? Statute doesn't define what good cause is. The county defines what good cause is. And am I right, Jeremy, that that we have approved requests like this in the past under circumstances where an entity did not know that it had property that it was exempt and asked for a filing late and received it, and received a, received a grant. Right. So, so in the event uh, we see this for Homestead all the time, we see this for churches and charities and that sort of situation. We most certainly have. Yes. And so, is there? A, there's not a difference in the statute about what good cause means for specific individuals. Whether a business receives a different standard than a, than a nonprofit. Is that right? right? The statute is silent. It's, it's the board's decision how they want to interpret and apply. So, my, my issue would be, uh, despite these late filings, the county had knowledge in April. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't on the proper form, but we had knowledge, and we we stated in the past with our actions that that is good cause. Uh, I think we've established a precedent that that's a good cause, and I think if we were to deny this, we'd be changing our precedent. Um, moreover, if we denied Mr. Mosier's request and a church came in next month and said, well, we noticed we've got some exempt property, can you please give us an exemption? And we say no, I think Mr. Mosier would have a pretty significant issue with us. Uh, so to be consistent, I think the, state, the county has established what good cause is, and I think, I mean, I'm inclined to stick with that, and so I'd be voting for the, uh, for the well, I have to agree. Um, I, mean, I, can, I can boil it down a little bit more simplistic, I think, than that. You're, you went right into the weeds, but uh, I just see that we weren't do it, and so to arbitrarily require it because of a failure to fill, file a form, and I wish to Dickens I had always done it every form I ever needed to do when I needed to do it. But uh, uh, there were some scriptures quote, quoted earlier, and I'll go back to it. He who is without sin cast the first stone. Um, I'm inclined to agree. So if you've made a motion, I'll second it. Well, I also didn't realize that, that uh, Brother Paul was with me. <laughs> <laughs> There's just no ill intent in any of this. I mean, it was just the forms, the state of North Carolina. We had a gentleman in here, I remember, out in the southern part of the community. His father discovered he had land, but he didn't know it. And, I mean, you can't beat people up for not knowing. And I just think this is all bad timing, so I'm supportive. The, the only difference I will, I, will, I will make here is I do agree with what you said. We really shouldn't be establishing a different way of way we do business. But the difference between his position and the gentleman who came in who did not know for 20 years that he had it is that's not his day job. That's your day job. It's your job to know these things. It's not our job to, you know, you're actually asking the state to exempt you from a tax that you owe. They decided that you didn't know it. And that's okay. That's the way state, state uh, legislatures work. But the difference between the gentleman who came in and we gave him relief was because he didn't know. It's not his day job. It's not his job to know about per it's his personal property. This is business property. Mm -hmm. So the only thing I will disagree with you gentlemen on, and, and, and ladies, is that's their job to know. 
And if you run a co- organization, if you run a company, and I know this firsthand, if you run a company in one state from another, you better know what the state that you're doing business in is is up to and what you're responsible for. And it was your responsibility. It's not our responsibility. You're actually already asking the taxpayers to give you a break anyway by, by, I, I, by exempting this this uh, this this uh, business property. I would you. say we didn't ask that. The legislature provided right. And you're just you're just you're just playing the game that they set the rules for you. I understand. I understand. But I, I, I don't see it the way the others do. I do think there is responsibility that the, or the, the company has to have. And you know, I think another thing that I... I, I so, I, Mr. Lashley, may I ask yes, a question? Yes, um, I understand your point in general. However, as, as was stated and, and recently discovered in, in the matter here, should, if this taxpayer had chosen not to file, mm-hmm. there are no issues. Why does that make sense to encourage taxpayers not to file something that should be filed? That makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense. And it but make, but, but that, that's sense. the path that would be followed going forward sure. for a taxpayer to hide because he'll get the better outcome than doing the right thing in file ballistic. I, I see what you're saying. It makes perfect sense what, what, your, uh, what your position is. Um, I won't go any further because I don't want to uh, poison the well, so to speak, but I do believe that um, I have a feeling that this isn't just a thousand dollar hickey. Why should that matter? Just the mm. principle. Well, I will say, I'll go back to my principle. If it was, if it was a, a, a large number don't you think that the companies responsible would be diving into that to figure out how we alleviate ourselves from that large number? If it's a small number, it's a, it's a number that you could sort of brush away and say, okay, it's, a, it's maybe an overhead issue, for lack of a better word. <coughs> you see what I'm saying? Let's take it to the other extreme. Yes, sir. Let's let say me, there's let a... Let me interrupt sure. there. I think, uh, I'm looking at my legal counsel, I think the amount of money in this regard no. makes no difference. Yeah, I agree. And we should I, not... I don't think we're allowed to consider. No, and I totally agree agree with that. I totally agree with that, 100%. Um, But I'm just talking to principle here. That's all. And I'm just saying that the only difference that I have am making here is the difference between you as a business. It's your job to know, and a a person who lives out in the county for 20 years didn't know they had a property issue. Uh, You always knew you were going to have a property tax with Alamance County. You always knew that. In your business, you knew that was going to be the case. At some point in time, you're going to have to write a check to Alamance County Tax. That's all. I understand your position, and uh, I think you did a great job laying it out for your client. I absolutely did. I think you did a great job. I would just like to tell you to never use the word just in front of a CPA. Because, <laughs> Lord have mercy, I hope they know how lucky they are to have you to represent them. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think I'm less to address this issue. Um, one, <coughs> and I've checked with our legal counsel, and Ms. Stevens has confirmed, and I've already knew this, the amount of money at stake is irrelevant in this decision. We cannot make our decision on whether it's $10 or a million dollars, and it's neither. <laughs> and I have not been told um, yeah, I have not asked Mr. Moser or Mr. Atkins the amount that's at stake. Um, some of you council members may or may not know, it doesn't matter, but we cannot consider that. The second issue is um, we often exempt churches in Mr. Turner's ex- illustration or resident, uh, residents and so forth, and we just routinely extend those, uh, those out as you're request, was requesting in this one. And I don't think we should be really distinguishing between for-profit and non-profit and or individual. Um, so I'm agreeing with Mr. Turner. I think we should allow the exemption or the extension. The application. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion, I think. Well, I, I, don't, I don't believe that was in the form of a motion, was it? I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the request. I'll second. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay, 41. 
Oh, uh, the request I have, next time keep it to about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate that, and I uh, thank you for that suggestion. <laughs> you told me I had all the time I needed. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to keep it brief, but I didn't know how to cover the points without um, going to that length, uh, without I apologize. I already said that. <laughs> well, in the, in the spirit of... Uh, yeah, I uh, transparency. I've known Brad and read <laughs> a number of his uh, audits for my clients in a previous life, so I, I know he's he doesn't leave any stone unturned. Ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time, I don't know. Mr. Lashley, we're not perfect. We try. Mm -hmm. Nobody is. Absolutely. It's so cool. We went to high school together, and the thought of us sitting here on each other is just <laughs> flipping you. crazy. Well, thank you all. I really appreciate your time, your consideration. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> okay, I'd like to acknowledge our state senator is present. Thank you. We appreciate it. And several other uh, school board members is present. Uh, and I did not acknowledge that early on. We thank you, um, folks, for being here. Now, I'm going to ask the sheriff, what time is your swearing in? I should already have been in church getting ready, but that's fine. Mm -hmm. Right. May, 11 o'clock. You got a siren. Turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> May we, and I'm asking the board now, amend our agenda. Um, one of the comments that I know that the county manager is going to make regards the sheriff's department. Uh, can we amend our agenda to move that up to the top? So the sheriff sure. and Judge Newby is uh, awaiting his swearing in and so forth. And that of itself is quite an honor. So uh, I have his autograph book, by the way. So, <laughs> uh, board, do we agree to move him up? Sure. Everyone That's agree? Right. Sheriff, if you would come forward. Sure. Our was, county manager will speak at this point. We were going to just announce during the manager's comments, uh, thanking the board for your support of law enforcement employees and that uh, in an effort to recruit and retain our law enforcement employees, an adjustment of $5,000 was made to their uh, salary as of December 1st. So. Do you I want to defend yourself? <laughs> do I, sir? And that's supposed to be fine. I said, do you, do you wish to defend yourself? <laughs> yes, sir, I do. Uh, we're, we're still 47 people short. However, we've got people coming that uh, some walk away some is applying now, and uh, the money that was used was lap salary and immigration and custom enforcement money, and I had to freeze my chief deputy position who just retired to make this happen. But I want to thank y'all for allowing us to be able to do that. Uh, and uh, I can tell you right now, uh, we're going to continue to lose people unless you know we work on these salaries. This isn't a bonus. This is their this is salary right. from here on, right? That's yes, correct. Unless it continues to get adjusted. Okay, that's correct. correct. Can I ask a couple questions? Is this yes. on top of what we did in July 1st? That's correct. Uh, how many people are we talking about? I mean, because we're getting ready to get into audit um, presentation, and this is going to land right smack dab in what I'm going to talk about. So how many people are we talking about? You, you're talking about about uh, 300. 300, so that's a million and a half bucks. It, it's, it's not not that much. I'll get the board a figure, but it is not that much. It's not no. Three hundred times five thousand is. It's okay. So it, it's effective December one, and it's lap salary, so it's already budgeted. It's right. no new money coming. Right. I I, I call it the lap salary. Okay. And how many also, that, that the lap salaries that are continuing to July will be applied to this. Um, let me ask Cheryl if she's here. Do you know how many people we're talking about? It was about 300, and it would okay. be prorated December through. So it'd only be like a half month. I'm, I'm just, you know, uh, Heidi, this is going to the conversation that we had on Friday right. about Budget my spreadsheet and why yes. my spreadsheet's off. This is one. Yeah. So I'm just, you know, this is just going to be put in my yeah. cell number 32. Yeah. <laughs> and give us the amount of money again that we're talking she about. I, I'll pull that for you. Okay, I didn't have that at the top of my head. Okay, I think it was around 600. I don't know. You need to tell us. 
I'm sorry, it's my spreadsheet. We would have copies, but you don't forget. In other words, like the point had again, that these are coming from LAPS salaries, so our budget does not change at all. I'd like to right. all those in the audience and listening in, our budget does not change, it does not increase the budget. Uh, Mr. Paisley, I'm going to disagree with you on that statement. All right. Because it's not going to affect you now, but six months from now, you're going to feel it. Six months from now, that is. Right. You don't feel it. So that, in essence, we just spent one and a half million dollars of next year's money. Just saying. I want to be technically accurate here. It will take a new increase in the salary line to sustain this moving forward. That is correct. That is correct. Yep. Thank you. I'm looking let for me, that number. I'm sorry. I don't while, while she's fearing, let me say this to the commissioners, and there's certainly no way to, to uh, convince you to uh, support this issue. But I was, I'm pressured of having to give a U.S. Marshal contract, ICE contract, and several other things to be able to keep. Because I'm not going to stand by and watch my detention officers and people outside continuously getting assaulted. Some have retired medically because of that. I will not allow my officers to be hurt any further. And if we lose those contracts, how much money are we talking about? You're looking at probably $7 million at least. So this is money well spent. Right. Sheriff D, $5,000 for, for whom? Who does it apply to? Sworn detention and sworn law enforcement outside officers. No uh, civilian employees were touched with this. No part-time employees were touched with this, et cetera. And uh, I mean, it, it's, it's no secret that Burlington just increased their wow. salaries for police and also Elon. Not only did they increase their salaries, they increased a lot of other stuff, and they're still starting more than we are. I think they're starting at 55 something. In Burlington, Elon just increased their salary because of the possibility of losing officers. If you hadn't done this, did you have a concern that, that deputies would, would migrate? To I, I'm just, just trying to think, but we had seven <coughs> in approach by Burlington and was looking to possibly go to Burlington, and we've lost some. To Burlington, some to Mevin. Uh, Mevin seems to be in a lot better financial shape, I rest in the county. We've lost some to them, we've lost some uh, uh, to Elon. But. The key here is to make sure all law enforcement is paid what they're supposed to be paid, that they're not feeling the need to go somewhere else, just like Department of Social Services. So many agencies within the county we're seeing that people are leaving because of that. This is true of Colin. Um, just like we saw the alleged stuff at Williams High School and how everybody was on top of that because of training and being ready for something like that. A hoax, thank you Jesus, but it might not have been a hoax. And you can't play with that at all. So I want to give a big shout out to all law enforcement that was part of that. So um, you, we just, we see across America what the shortage of law enforcement is happening to the areas that have kind of maybe turned their back on them a little bit. So I think we're supposed to really honor our law enforcement and all of our other agencies are first responders because everybody wants you to be there as soon as you call 911 and, and you always are. So whatever we need to do as a county to support these agencies, we need to do it. Thank you, commissioners. I do have that figure for you. Uh, it will cost 877571 and 92 cents for the seven month period. Uh, seven months. Yeah. Can you say that again? 877 877-571-92. And that is taking our uh, initial starting pay from 41 to 46, which is still well below sure. Burlington's. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. I would ask. Yes, sir. Uh, the two of us that know Judge Newby, uh, we're going to try to get the, what time is the swearing the in? The actual swearing in is at 1230. Oh, nice. We plan to, to have there, you there. Yes, sir. But if we're not, please tell Judge Newby hello. I'm sure we will. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. Okay. Um, we're going to take a 10 minute break before we, we do your presentation, if that's all right. Uh, we're back in session. <laughs> Ms. Evans, are you going to introduce this one? I will be glad to. Um, commissioners, before you this morning, I present Elsa Watts. She will make our audit presentation, and I'm going to turn it over to her now. Yes. And the here, 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 here,
This is the Bill Lashley hour right here. Uh, I'll be glad when it's over. This weekend has not been fun. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. On behalf of Martin Starnes and Associates, I'd like to present Alamance County's audited financial statements. Some audit highlights. The county received an unmodified opinion. This is a clean audit opinion. I'd like to thank Susan Evans, as well as the rest of her staff for all their hard work on the audit this year. Um, we work with several departments in the county. Everyone gives us our information timely and we appreciate that working relationship. <coughs> And I want to mention that Susan is the uh, finance officer and she has the skill, knowledge, and experience to oversee the audit services, which is a requirement under the 2018 Government Auditing Standards provision. <laughs> for the general fund, you had revenues for the year of $196.6 million, an increase of about 8%. You had expenditures of $188.7 million, an increase of about 21%. I will detail these further along in the presentation. Looking at your fund balance for the general fund, fund balance was $84.7 million, an increase of about $13.2 million. Revenues continue to exceed expenditures. Looking at your available fund balance, um, you had total fund balance of $84.7 million. <coughs> you had non-spendable items of $152,000. Stabilization by state statute of $16.1 million. This gives you an available fund balance calculation of $68.4 million. An increase in your available fund balance of just over $9 million. what's going on here. Bruce, can you advance the slide? It's oh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. Try again, Kate. Okay. Um, available fund balance as a percent of expenditures for the general fund was 36.3%. Mm -hmm. Unassigned fund balance for the general fund was $41.8 million. You had total general fund expenditures of $188.7 million. This gives you an unassigned fund balance percentage of 22.16. What's our target on that? 20%. 20%. Our target? 20%. 20%. Top three revenues for the general fund were your property taxes at 53%, local option sales taxes at 22%, Restricted intergovernmental revenues, your federal and state grants, 13%, and then other revenues were 12%. Property taxes were at $103.8 million, an increase of about 2%, overall very comparable. Local option sales taxes were $43.7 million, an increase of about 11%. This increase is due to increases in consumer spending. Your federal and state grants were at $26.4 million, an increase of 22%. This is primarily due to an increase in grant funding. Top three expenditures for the general fund were human services at 19%, public safety at 25%, education at 27%, and other expenses at 29%. Education was at 51.9 million, an increase of about 4%, overall very comparable. Human services was at 35.7 million, an increase of 16%. This increase is due to the change in the recording of ARPA funds for salaries. Public safety expenditures were 46.3 million, an increase of 19%. Again, this increase is due to recording of ARPA salaries. Looking at your landfill fund, you had operating income of 1.2 million, investment and capital assets of 9.5 million, unrestricted net position of 12.8 million, and total net position of 22.4 million. Looking at your quick ratio for the landfill fund, 
You had current assets of $28.3 million, current liabilities of $138,000, and this gives you a quick weight ratio of 205.3. The LGC would be concerned if it were less than one. And then you had some performance indicators this year. Um, there was a red flag identified. Um, you had some current year findings. So the first finding is um, related to one employee's pay rate was approved to an incorrect amount. And this finding requires a response. Uh, the LGC requires a response by the, the board members for this one. And then um, additional compliance findings were WIC had no evidence of second party review. A third finding is a WIC recipient received six months of benefits after they should have been terminated. This resulted in a question cost of $369. And then public school building capital fund reports were not submitted timely. And then additionally, the last one. Excuse me. The last one public school building capital fund reports were not submitted timely. And then um, that concludes the findings. Then um, the county did submit the audit timely and met the deadline this year for the audit submission. And last year was a part. Mm -hmm. Correct. <clears throat> the public school building fund, is this all the bills that's going on? The new additions, the new bills as part of the bond and all of that? Or I'll let Susan it deals that. with the state lottery okay, um, okay. and there was a delay in communication between ABSS and the county okay. um, but we have worked to correct that and get procedures better tightened up. Okay great thank you. Mm -hmm. And this does conclude my presentation does anyone have any questions? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> let me get a clear piece of paper. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So let's start with Mr. Charles. Yeah. Uh, nothing for now, thank you. Mr. Carter. Nothing for now. Nothing for me. My representative's going to talk for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just had one question I want you to clarify mm -hmm. uh, about the percentages of sure. of our of our fund balance. I think it went down from went from 39 to 36. I'm looking at the presentation. I got some windows open here. <laughs> Yeah, it's the uh, 38.1 versus the 36.3. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me the, why these numbers are different? Okay. Um, so basically, you had an increase in your overall fund balance of 13 million, and you had an increase of your stabilization by state statute. That's basically your accounts receivable. Gotcha. Um, so that increased, which they kind of net out, and then um, you also had increases in your expenses from about 155 million to 188 million. Oh, so, like, so it's two, the combination of those factors. I wonder if that's a 250 I missed. Okay. All right. That's good. Um, I see that you say that the um, the overall increase is $9 million over what we, revenues to expenses. That actually would be um, 13 million revenues to expenses. No, I'm talking about in this audit. Um, the the uh, increase fund in the, the fund balance. He's talking about the 9 million in fund balance. I'm sorry, okay. I, didn't, I didn't see that. Yes, you're right. There's 9 million in fund balances, that's what you're For total fund balance. Okay. Total fund balance. Okay. okay. Um, sure. Nothing. Do, do you, uh, d does anyone on the staff know what, I'm asking you for a number that I already know what it is. What, what, was, what was the budget that we voted for? What was the number, what, was it 184,750 million? And that's an expenditure number that you and I talked about, right? Right, right. So the total budget that was approved, mm -hmm. and hold on, that's the finals. Let me pull up the budget ordinance from fiscal year 22. I promise, folks, this is the last question. Bear with me just one minute. You take your time. And I would like to clarify that one of the differences where you see that there is $9 million that has been added to available fund balance 
is that's when you're getting into your fund balance categories. Overall total, the county did add the 13.2 million to fund balance, but what is available um, and unassigned increased by that nine million budget. So just to clarify that a little bit. Great explanation. Here's an example of something that goes into the fund balance that is not, that is assigned. What increases fund balance, but, but that is assigned? That's on a, that's, that's so not on a sign. Right. What's an example of yeah. that? I'm sorry, if you'll ask your question one more time. I was looking at the figure for Mr. For Commissioner Larson. Uh, I'm sorry. So nine million went into unrestricted fund balance. Yes. Four, about four million went into restricted fund balance. That's correct. What's an example of something that increases fund balance, but that is restricted in its use? Okay, so something that does that is when we are adopting our budget for the next year and there is that appropriation of fund balance to fill that budgetary gap, right. then that it then is put into a reserve. Also uh, putting into a reserve to make sure that we are able to sustain our accounts receivables for the coming year, that amount goes in there as well as any outstanding encumbrances. So those are things that we have to prepare for the next year. They're restricted. And that figure, if I'm not mistaken, was around $16 million for fiscal year 22. So it's not that the revenue that comes in is restricted. It's <coughs> that you have to allocate a certain amount of the revenue that is over and above to restricted funds. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Uh, and that difference, if I remember correctly, isn't that, aren't we talking about a number that is a where we've used fund balance to balance the budget in the projection. Right. So That's we're correct. over in revenues, so we aren't going to spend that, but That's it's still correct. restricted. That's correct. It's restricted in the event that we do have to dip into those revenues, right. that they're there. Um, but historically, we have not had to do that in many, many years. But it's six months out, and we That's could. correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in answer to your question, Commissioner Lashley, the budget was adopted at $184,265,020. Perfect. Very good. The reason I want that number to be out there is because I want to talk about it later. I don't want to talk about it right now. I don't think it's appropriate, but I just want to uh, thank you for that because I think we need to talk about that number compared to the 188 number. Mm -hmm. We need to talk about I don't know if now's the proper time. You think so? Yep. Okay, let's do it. <clears throat> well, this is basically uh, for the tape and it's for my fellow commissioners here. I just wanted my commissioners, if we could go back to the, um, the, the, the slide where it have the very first one, the 188 number. This is what I want to focus on because Ms. Evans just gave us the number that we as a board voted on, $184,265,020. Does that number look like anywhere close to 188, 726? Of course not. It's because we spent four and a half million dollars more than we budgeted for. Now, and the reason we're very lucky is we had somebody in the, um, in the sales tax arena to give us the extra funds that we needed. And I will say this, I'll toot my own horn here. I had our, had our revenues uh, coming in at 197 million. So I'm off by $350,000 on that. But what I want to bring attention to is a focus on, uh, as a board, and this is for my board members, we can't, we, 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 this is a really good report, but it could be a great report if we'd stop spending money that we say that we're not going to spend. And you know, I will say as far as transactional things are, uh, as we transact in, in, in accounts, it's almost impossible to say that we did not spend money out of our fund balance to, as we went down the road. Because as we got this money, our, our spending's going up. And if we put, I believe the number is $2 million in our, in our to, to balance the 184 number. I think we had $2 million we brought over from our fund balance. So if we did that, and if you looked at that number, the number is a whole lot worse than four and a half million dollars. So I'm saying, what I'm saying, Ms. Evans, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, because I could be wrong here. 
as we went down the road for the 21-22 season, as we went down the road, we can tell that we spent more money than we allocated in our budget. And that would have to occur over time, like maybe two months, over a two month period, we spent an extra a million dollars that we did not have budgeted for. So as we're doing that, that money's gotta come from someplace. It, and it's, um, correct me if I'm wrong, did it, come, it has to come from our fund balance. Not entirely. Okay. Um, and the reason is, is that the 184 million, that was our initial budget adoption. Mm -hmm. Through the course of the year, when departments are bringing before the commissioners an approval for a budget amendment, that's to accept funds from outside organizations, whether that be through grants or additional state and federal dollars. So our, our budget is being amended. At the end of the fiscal year, we had a total expenditure budget of $197 million. So through the course of our budget being amended by about $13 million, it's not all coming from fund balance, with that being said, because there were outside dollars coming in to sustain those budget amendments. So when those grants come in, did it, did it come in on both sides of our ledger? Yes. Okay, so we're getting increased revenues, but we also have increased spending. That's correct. So in essence, that four and a half million dollar number is maybe not quite as high as we're thinking. Exactly. That's exactly where I was getting ready to go. That, so we're, we're Thank I'm, you, sir. Uh, um, that's great information, and I yes. think the folks need to know how, how these things yes. come about. It's through the acceptance of grants and other state dollars that come in that <clears throat> offset the burden of the property tax. Um, it keeps that burden off of our citizens when we accept those grants and are able to fund it through other through property and sales tax. And most of those grants didn't require a local Match. That's nope. correct. There's only very few that require a local match, and that's brought before the commissioners for approval at the time of, of, um, of application for the grant. Yep. I just wasn't thinking about the uh, dual sides of the ledger. Yeah, Increasing but state the law, we have to maintain a balanced so budget on both sides. And, and look again, because I do know, looking at my notes, that there were a couple of uh, budget amendments that we did not have grants for. This was budget amendments for mm -hmm. salaries and And that like is that. that is true. There are some budget amendments that were brought to, brought to the board where we said we want to use appropriated fund balance for these expenditures. Okay. So Thanks. there's a there's a balance yeah. there. Thank you so much. You're welcome. For your expertise. I really do appreciate it. And I'm done. Mr. Chairman, uh, just a follow up. I, I think it would be helpful though to address Mr. Lassie's concern is that if we zero out the grants both on both sides of the ledger and then see what the actual numbers are as to budget. I, I can help you with that, Commissioner Turner. Yeah. I've already uh, made the adjustment with my spreadsheet. Okay. And uh, we will, I, I will, I can make these yeah. known to you whenever you ask. Yeah, okay. In a perfect world, <laughs> salaries would never have to be increased and we'd have no additional expenses from the time we set the budget. We don't have a perfect world. <laughs> no, we don't. But I would like to hold up what uh, the definition of a budget is. And I really like to make this point to my department heads. <clears throat> when you bring us a budget, live with it. And if you made some mistakes, then we can talk about it. But I'm just saying a budget is something that we should adhere to. We should not be going above. Now, I understand what Ms. Seven said. Perfect sense. You did, a, you did a great job explaining it. But going forward, let's live. We spend days listening to department heads tell us what they want, what they need. Okay, well, when the budget comes out, live with it. Do it. Like Meredith Edwards says. I have to live within my budget at home, and I know how to tighten the belt when I need to. And she hasn't come back to us. I use her as an example of a department head who hasn't come back to us asking us for more money. She makes a presentation and she lives with it. And I just wish everyone in the department would know what the definition of a budget is. Well, and what, what's the point of having a budget if you're not going to adhere to it? That's my only point, and I'll, I'll shut up. I'm good with that. Any other commissioner have questions? We appreciate your presentation. Absolutely. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. It was very thorough. I really enjoyed reading the 240 pages. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.
will be sending her a Christmas card, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. County Attorney. Nothing substantive for me. I just want to acknowledge the hard work of the finance department in helping to work on the bonds that you approved earlier this morning. Um, that is not an easy self-executing process. So specifically, Crystal Briska and finance did a great job of helping us work through that. That's all I have. Thank you. County Manager. Uh, commissioners, you had asked to bring the courthouse uh, presentation back to you during this meeting or your next December meeting. We are going to hold that and bring it back in January along with Davenport who will be adjusting your financial model so that we can have a more holistic conversation about how we're going to pay for whatever price tag we land on. So you'll see that back uh, before you in January. Thank you. That's all I had. Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. Uh, I just want to make sure I got this correct. At approval of the consent agenda, we had removed 7A and 7D2. Are we going to come back to 7D2? Yeah, I think we were going to bring back the uh, coalition assessment grant to a future meeting for a more thorough discussion of that application. And you wanted to to do the appointments during at the end of the meeting. Right. Okay. Yeah, that was moved to. I'm I'm not sure whether it'll be the uh, December 19 or one of our meetings in January. Good question. Thank you. Ms. Thompson, since I'm looking that direction, do you want to be first on commissioner's comments? No. Everybody faint. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas! <laughs> nope, ain't got things to say. I said it all the rest time. I like those comments. Mr. Lashley. I have nothing, Chairman. Mr. Turner. Just a quick uh, shout out to the Burlington Police Department uh, for their efforts last week with the, uh, the issue of Williams High School. Uh, I got two students at Williams High School. This hit home. This was a credible threat, um, and the Burlington Police Department acted swiftly and in force as they should have. Um, and so I want to commend them on that. I know there was there's some criticism that that ABSS didn't respond quickly enough to get the word out. I mean, I, I as I mentioned, I've got kids there. I, I was getting texts as this was happening, uh, as I'm sure other parents were. Uh, and it's inevitable that some of those comments are going to get to social media and we'll get there before ABSS can, can put out credible information. So th that's bound to happen in today's society. ABSS responded as quickly as they could with credible information, with the information that they had, and we've got to allow ABSS to assess the information and get out information that is not just timely but accurate. And I, I commend them as well because, because they, uh, they did a good job there. Um, I, I understand that this was part of a larger uh, nefarious effort across the state to, to put uh, out information that there was active shooting events going on at some schools across our state, and maybe broader than that. Uh, and I just hope that uh, that our law enforcement works with the SBI and others to to catch these people and pro when they, that they are prosecuted by uh, by Mr. Boone to the fullest extent of the law. This is a, a form of. Uh, modern day terrorism, in my, in my view, um, and this just has no place, and we need to take it as seriously as, uh, as the Burlington Police Department did. Thank you. Mr. Carr. Yes. Um, as many of you in the audience know, all commissioners serve on a number of different boards and committees. I happen to serve on the uh, Park Board of Trustees, which is the uh, uh, Piedmont Authority for Regional Transportation, and they offer a service, um, which I've shared a copy of the information with each of the commissioners here today, uh, to provide van transportation for employees of an industry or business, or for government, and that is a benefit to um, the employees of a company or. or, or employees of government and so I just wanted to present that information today this is some information I have available on it I'm going to leave it here with the county manager so that they can have it available in case somebody comes in to check but if you own an industry or a 
business in the community or an agency where you have employees that might otherwise have a difficult time getting to and from work, this is an option as a service you can provide to your employees. The uh, part provides a van and a driver. Uh, they, uh, they charge the agency or the, ind the industry for the service and then the, it's provided as a benefit to the employees. Uh, the, the company or the whatever can, can I guess so reasonably charge its employees if they want to for that benefit or they can provide it no charge. So I uh, just wanted to make sure that was available today and we have that information available. All of us serve on a number of different boards and committees and, uh, and we try to keep our fellow commissioners up to date on the different issues that we're engaging when we're out there. Uh, you've heard from all of us at different times I think on the different issues that might come before the board of commissioners. Not all of them come up before us, but um, it's a good meeting. I think we got, with everything we had to try and cover, we got it done timely. So I'm, uh, I'll let you finish your comments and then I'll offer a motion to adjourn. Can I, can I just say something, John, with that, because I just forgot. I wanted to thank Craig Turner for coming to the DSS um, board meeting last week because um, he got to hear, hear firsthand about the shortages, how critical they are, how overwhelmed they are, how of a burden they are. And uh, I let them know that I would be coming off their board because um, I've been on two years. I'm all about rotating and I really appreciated um, Craig coming. I, I'm sure he got a different insight of that. That's a, that's a hard working bunch of people. They all are, but I'm just, I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Would you also speak to Act? and the fact that they sometimes provide transportation. That's true. I'm also on that board, back to the uh, Alamance County Transportation Authority. They uh, provide services, and right now we extended a period of time in which we provide those transportation services at no charge. So um, their van and door-to-door uh, uh, -door services available to people who might be um, handicapped or in, in, in being capable of paying and uh, to and from doctors, to and from different kinds of appointments and things of that nature, but I don't otherwise have transportation all over the county. At this point, uh, just a couple of minor things to our board. Uh, I would encourage us when the county commissioner's comments to just keep the board up to date on the committees that you've been assigned to. Uh, I think that's really the purpose of these commissioners' responses. Uh, so I'll encourage us to do that. Uh, we took off the assignment of committees from the consent agenda because it uh, procedurally does not require a vote. It's part of our procedure that the chairman uh, do that. And of course that could not have been done prior to the election earlier this morning. Um, additionally, I've talked to all five of those commissioners, including that Paisley guy, <laughs> and I think we're all in agreement with the assignments and so forth, so I'm going to hand those out, and Thomas, if uh, you'll check with our clerk, you can have those if you yeah, like. Okay. Thank you. Um, I can testify that he does occasionally talk to himself, so... <laughs> We have a meeting on the 19th, uh, 19 days to Christmas, and I'm done. Do we have a motion? Motion to adjourn. Second. Have a motion second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. 
Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.